welcome Hoosier fans to another, feels like we've been here before, episode of the Assembly Call as tonight your Indiana Hoosiers fall to Michigan State 64 to 58. Uh, it drops IU to 12 and 13 on the season and 7 and 11 in the Big Ten. I'm your host, Andy Bottoms, here with the other coach, Jeff Marlowe and Chris Williams, a.k.a. I, AKA IU Artifacts, and we'll break it all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU postgame show. Uh, this was a game, guys, that saw uh, a lot of fouls, um, certainly, and uh, really, really limited any flow that the game had. But ultimately, it was a tight game going down the stretch. Uh, IU only ends with, up with one player in double figures. That was Rob Finnessy, who really kept IU in it for stretches early. Uh, but Aaron Henry just took over uh, down the stretch for Michigan State. I think scored 10 or 12 straight points on his own at one point. IU just had no answer for him defensively which sounds a lot like the first matchup uh, that these two teams had he ends with 22 points and really put them over the top uh, down the stretch and uh, dropped IU you know just another disappointing conference loss that they uh, you know were, were in the game for really all of it no, neither team really pulled ahead uh, by any wide margin until uh, until late um, uh, but it, it was um you know, just just kind of what we've seen from this IU team. It was just not enough from the guards. Uh, Trace Jackson Davis only ends up with five shots over the course of the game and nine points. Uh, was was frustrated by the way that uh, Michigan State was was really physical with him, and uh, you know, just again, it, it just felt like a similar uh, similar refrain from from what we've seen from so many games with this IU team, uh, where they just hung around and struggled on the stretch. The defense uh, defense really wilted late. And ended up shooting two of twenty from three point range. So uh, those are all uh, have become hallmarks, I think, of of the way IU has played uh, has played at times this season. And tonight, unfortunately, was no different. Uh, but we're going to start the show uh, how we begin every show, and that is with our Who's Your Proud Banner moment. And there were a couple options for this. There were actually some some really nice individual plays uh, that, uh, that that were made here. I'm going to give one to Christian Lander. There was a, a play that he made, grabbed a rebound, threw the ball about 70 feet down the floor, just over, I think it was Hauser's arm, uh, a Michigan, just over a Michigan State defender to race Thompson for a layup. And I thought it was a game that Christian Lander played uh, really well in, and, and quite honestly, we can get into this later. I'm not so sure that he should have gotten taken out down the stretch. He ended up with uh, seven points and a couple assists. I thought played one of his better games, no turnovers, either in 22 minutes and uh, you know, just kind of flashed in that moment the kind of playmaking that that he has, and uh, made multiple two point shots in the game as well. But uh, that play was just a beautiful play. There were there were a couple others uh, that Race Thompson was on the uh, was on the receiving end of um, that were in the running for me for the banner moment. But I guess you know at this point in the season, I think everybody is looking forward a little bit to next year, and I think a, a lot of that. Uh, a lot of that starts with you know seeing Christian Lander get more minutes and, and grow into his role as the point guard uh, of the team, and I thought that play to Race Thompson uh, came at a key moment in the game, but also was uh, you know just a, a great one uh, and, and showed that the kind of passing talent that he has. All right, our banner moment, as always, is brought to you by our friends at Homefield Apparel, who is now in their fourth season of sponsoring the Assembly Call, and that is not what I meant to play there. I'm having uh, similar experiences as IU tonight. The, the officials really took me out of rhythm. All right. Uh, so with the frigid temperatures finally starting to subside outside and spring just around the corner, it's time to update your wardrobe with some comfy T-shirts and long sleeve tees. So you need to make your way over to their website, Homefield Apparel, where they have something unique for everyone, especially IU fans. And all of their apparel is printed on the softest, most comfortable, and most washable materials you'll find anywhere. Uh, one a few suggestions. I picked up a couple different IU shirts over the the winter in preparation for the summer. One of them is the uh, the oval that I'm sure Jared will not be super excited to hear about. Uh, but they've also come out with some uh, some great new things recently. They have a uh, George Washington basketball T-shirt that I will likely be buying at some point. Came out with another great UC Irvine shirt uh, that's out there. Although I already have bought one UC Irvine shirt from there, so probably uh, tough to argue that I need a second one. Uh, and, and because of that, it's not just IU gear, even though the IU gear is, uh, is fantastic. And Chris has uh, one of the sweatshirts on uh, tonight. But Homefield Apparel has more than 90 different colleges and universities now, and new ones are being added all the time. 
Plus, the designs are so unique, interesting, and vintage that you may end up like Coach or I, where you buy shirts or hoodies from schools you barely heard of just because you like the design. And you can always save on your home field apparel order by using the promo code ASSEMBLY20 at checkout. It'll give you 20% off your entire order throughout the year. So go to homefieldapparel.com, load up your shopping cart, and enter ASSEMBLY20 at checkout to get 20% off. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. All right, it's time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. Uh, tonight, let's uh, start with IU Artifacts. Chris, thoughts on the uh, game tonight, the six-point loss at Michigan State? Well, um, I mean, where do we go with this? I think I liked the way we started out aggressive in the start of the game. Um, I really liked the uh, – the drive and dunk attempt by Rob to get to the foul line about the 16-20 mark in the first half. I thought he came out and, and played exactly as we always have wanted him to play his entire three years and be that aggressive player he can be. And, you know, Robbie Hummel on the broadcast says, you know, why can't this be the game for Robbie Rob Fennessy every game? And I think we've, you know, we're beating our heads against the wall thinking that the whole season. But I, I liked his aggressive play. I, I thought that – um you know, it, it was good to see, but the, the the big problem was is that Michigan State packed the lane the whole game, and we saw that Trace was unable to get the ball. Um, you know, one of their wings would drop down every single time because they, you know, we shot ten percent from three point line. So why wouldn't you just pack the lane and and force us to shoot when we're not hitting them? So that was kind of the game plan. You know, they kind of doubled down the second half, which was kind of frustrating, and we really couldn't get Trace going, but. Again, it just comes down to shooting. Uh, when you shoot as poorly as we did, you're not going to win games. And and when shots aren't falling, you're not going to stay competitive. And we're just lucky that Michigan State, for the most part, till Aaron Henry got going, shot as abysmal as we did. And and that was really the key to the game, I think. And it's just, you know, um, it, it's not really a lot you can say right now. We're very much on the outside looking in and, uh, you know, in, in many ways, the, the door is closed. So it's kind of a – unfortunate reality that we have to face right now yeah i mean as you said chris the, the spacing just got worse and worse the the less iu was able to make shots and in addition to how physical michigan state was with trace the you know just complete lack of room for him to operate was a was a big one um and and we'll talk about that more there was a, a moment they showed where he got frustrated on the sidelines i i think robbie hummel made some uh and i i really enjoy him as a commentator i thought he was um, trying to connect some dots that I don't know were really connected with with the root of that, but uh, we, maybe we'll find out after the game. Maybe we won't, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about Trace. But that was uh, definitely an issue. And, and to your point, Chris, the fact that the game was uh, unwatchable in long stretches from an offensive standpoint from both teams allowed IU to hang around despite not playing very well uh, on the offensive end at all. All right. Uh, joining us once again is uh, Coach Jeff Marlowe. Jeff, uh, what's your, uh, what are your thoughts on the game tonight? Well, we kind of talked about off the air, Andy. I just it, it, we have a great big, and there's a lot of great bigs in the Big Ten this year. But when it really gets down to it, it's still a guards game. You win with gar- great guards, and Aaron Henry willed his team to a win tonight, and we don't. We just don't have that. And, I, and, and, again, not just trying to harp on the same old, same old, but tonight was a great example. We were down by one. I think it was 53-52. I was trying to find my notes here. And Al shot a three, wide open three, shooting 40%, been playing well down the stretch. And, again, I do I somewhat agree. I think we'll talk about it later. I would have liked to have seen Lander stay in the game a little bit. But, but Al's wide open, and he shoots an air ball. It's, it's an air ball. And then they come down, and Henry hits a three, and we really never recovered after that. Great guards are what win, not just the Big Ten, but college basketball. Nice to have a great big. Trust me, I like having TJD. But when he's struggling and you don't have good guard play, it really, really handicaps you offensively. I made a couple comments earlier in my notes on that I really liked Chris talking about beginning of the game. We played aggressive. We were attacking the lane. We seemed to play with a little better pace and tempo. We had a couple moments, the one you highlighted with Lander throwing that one ahead to race. And I don't understand why we don't play that way. And to me, that's to kind of that disconnect I see where if it's being preached in practice, it's not being carried over to the game. And I'm just not sure it's being preached in practice because we see flashes of it, but we never sustain that type of play and that play, that type of tempo for, you know, big chunks of the game, let alone 40. 
Yeah, the, the, let's start there. I, I think the the guard play, as you mentioned, is a big one. But I also think the pace. I mean, the, all the good plays that I, I mentioned, maybe this was because the game had so little scoring and it was hard to find find good plays. But a lot of them were IU pushing the ball. It was, you know, Rob had a nice, he, he dug down on somebody in the post, stole the ball, went coast to coast for a layup. Didn't hesitate, just went. Uh, also had a nice rebound, dished it to race for a dunk that wasn't in one opportunity. I think the free throw was missed there. Galloway, you know, they had a hit ahead to him for a layup that made it eleven to seven early. It was like a lot of the game, a lot of the the plays that I called out as as positive ones for IU are when they put the ball in transition a bit more. And and quite honestly, it makes no sense not to do that for a team that really struggles in the in half court settings. And it was a you know a, a play in the second half where they spent fifteen seconds trying to run Galloway on the baseline. And I'm like, if he gets the ball, what is he going to do with it uh, at the point when they were doing that? They did have a little bit of success running Rob off of some curls where he made a, a nice dish to, uh, I think it was Jerome uh, on one of those plays. But yeah, guard play just continued to be really uneven. You got a, you got a nice showing from Rob Finnessy, albeit not necessarily from a shooting perspective, but he ends up with 16 points. Again, the only Hoosier in double figures. He was six of six or six of 16 from the floor, I believe. Um, he is not the guy that you probably want taking. Uh, the bulk of your shots. He was two of eight from three, made both free throws, six rebounds, four assists, uh, a couple steals. Did did have two turnovers, but I thought overall it was a good game from Rob, and I thought the play that Chris mentioned early from him really set the tone where he tried to dunk on somebody, which kind of caught me completely off guard and probably Michigan State as well, but I think it spoke to the mindset that he came out with in the game. But then you look down, and Al Durham ends up with three points all on free throws, 0 of seven from the floor, 0 for three uh, from three, ended up fouling out of the game. One rebound, no assists, and, and uh, that, that play that Jeff mentioned was a big one with him. And and I thought Lander played well, seven points, three rebounds, a couple assists, but just you know just didn't get enough out of Al. This team, especially with Armand out, isn't going to be able to survive performances like this from Al Durham. Um, and it's not a lack of of effort necessarily, but I just thought Al fell into some of the traps that he's fallen in before, driving to try to get fouled, not to score. Uh, that that played a key role in, I think, one of the led to one of the threes that Gabe Brown hit in another you know big stretch where he would do that. And then you know missing that three, that's a shot you want. You passed up a, a potential look in the post to get what looked like a better three-pointer, and, and they just missed. And so, you know, again, can't get everybody firing at the same time. So, um, you know, Chris – general thoughts on the on the guard play and and I guess I, what I talked about with you guys before we came on maybe this is the question I, I struggle with taking Lander out based on how he was playing and putting Al back in based on how he was playing and that is easy to say as hindsight now but even in the moment it didn't make a lot of sense to me um I, I, any thoughts on on that or or other uh commentary on the on the guards you know I just think I'm trying to think back to where we had a game where Lane, where Rob and Al were actually playing both at the potential that we have wanted them to play. And I can't honestly think of a game during Big Ten play. There was probably something close. But, you know, it seems to be that they kind of go through this roller coaster effect, especially Al more because he's been at least more consistent than Rob has been, especially offensively. But, you know, one of the things we saw is – and we I'm not – this we can say all we want about the officiating too many fouls, lack of fouls in certain situations. But the fact is, is we got caught in that situation of trying to be aggressive to the basket where we had a guard going up against, you know, one of their bigs that was not going to be able to, you know, that played straight up and we try to draw these fouls. And like you said, Al just kind of tries to go in and create something and it wasn't happening. And so, you know, with Lander, you know, I think with him is that the maturity is there and the the vision on the floor, we keep hearing about that, and the pass to race was tremendous. Um, I I would have been fine to see Land, Lander more in the second half. I think that Michigan's guard or Michigan State's guards are obviously more aggressive and and bigger, and that's the size thing. I think was a big problem for us um, throughout the game. But I, I think in the end, you know, we tried so much driving to the basket that wasn't working. The shot wasn't working. Um, you know, I, I'm not concerned about the turnovers. I think we only had eight turnovers and Archie's preached about, you know, pr- you know, protecting the ball and staying under, t- under, you know, 10 turnovers to the game. I just think that if we don't have, especially with Armon out, if we don't have consistency among our upperclassmen playing cohesively in one game together, that really dwindles our chances, especially when our best player is not getting anything down low because they're just packing the lane. And we keep talking about that, but that, you know, that's the thing that's that's killed us. And we keep preaching about this is that 
we can't get Al and Rob to play cohesively together, having a good offensive game and leading us to victory. It just hasn't happened, and that's that's been our Achilles heel the whole year. Yeah, Jeff, uh, I know you alluded to it a little bit, but uh, any other angles of the, the guard play that you want to hit? Yeah, and I, and I think Chris brings up a great point. I think the only game I might be able to point to where both those played well was maybe the game at Iowa where Rob and Al had, you know, really kind of synchro game where they played together. I really liked the lineup, and we've been talking about this in the community. I know Jared had been talking about it a couple times on the shows with you guys. I loved it when they finally when he finally put Rob and Lander in the lineup together and had Rob coming off the ball, playing off the ball. I know he didn't hit shots, but I really felt like the offense at least looked a little better. We had a little bit more motion to it, and and and, and we were getting some screens. We just didn't hit them. But I agree with Chris to a certain degree. Your best player wasn't giving us much tonight, and that has a lot to do with the Michigan State defense. And you're really your second best player on the sideline, probably out for the season in Armand. So somebody's got to step up. And and I agreed with what you said earlier about the, the just the the fouls and and some of the fouls that Drone got, especially, but even a couple that Trey got in the half court really kind of disrupted flow. And and but our guards just you know it's just been a struggle all season for them. And tonight when you needed one of them to another again, we said this all year long. Long. two of them we, we needed we had one Rob we needed a second one to step up but I would have liked to seen Lander get more run down the stretch he hit that runner with about seven minutes to go a uh, little left uh, his natural hand left hand little runner there in the lane and then we took him out and he never came back and I, I just would have liked to seen him play down the stretch and see what you know if he could get some growth there because he's the point guard of the future and I'm not saying it's all about the future I just think that I would have liked to have seen him and Rob and then maybe Jerome finish the game along with Trace and Race. And I think that's right now our best offensive lineup because, like you pointed out earlier, the, the offense is more dynamic when Landers on the floor. Yes, he makes mistakes. I'm not saying he's perfect. But he sees openings. That pass to race, he had a nice little pocket pass early in the first half for a feed. The other guards aren't either can't or won't make those plays, and the offense tends to be a little more dynamic when he's out there. But – yeah, Chris pointed out you can't shoot two for twenty from three. I mean, I, I liked I've been one one to shoot more threes, and they shot twenty of them tonight. But you got to hit more than two. Yeah, I thought I thought one of the other big factors, and we don't need to linger on this too terribly long because uh, I want to talk about Trace a little bit um, before we take our first break. But I, I thought Jerome getting himself in foul trouble in the second half was. Uh, maybe an underrated storyline of of what happened. I, I thought he came out, got one. Uh, in the post early, then got another one kind of going for a steal where the guy really wasn't in a position to hurt him. That one was a silly one. And then his fourth one was equally silly where he's got the guy, you know, you let Henry shoot over the top of you, but he basically walked up underneath him. The officials were calling stuff like that. They weren't calling other stuff off the ball quite as much, um, you know, in different parts of the game. I just thought picked up two of those four were just silly. And, and really, when I think Archie had said on his pregame show that he wanted Jerome to try to guard Aaron Henry, at least from a length standpoint, I think he could give him a little bit of trouble. But boy, whenever Hunter wasn't in there, I, Henry attacked him a little bit more in the post, but he didn't try to attack him off the dribble. But man, anytime you had Galloway, Leal was in there for a minute, he went after him, had got Lander on him once or twice, like he would just take those guys into the post and go to work on him. And I thought Jerome not being able to be out there both from a floor spacing and shooting standpoint, but also from a at least a potential defensive standpoint, really loomed large in the second half. Even though Jerome was not playing well and the you know, his shot selection at the beginning of the half was not very good. Um and there was a part of me that was like, you need to take him out of the game, but I, I think he had at least the potential to give you something there that really put him in a bind. Um you know, Jeff, any any thoughts on not necessarily Jerome's play, but just kind of how those fouls and, and his absence impacted what IU was able to do lineup wise in an already shorthanded roster with tons of guys in foul trouble. I, I think you're right, Andy. I think that Jerome, at least age wise, is more mature and could handle a kid like Aaron Henry in the post. I when I when we were coaching, when I was coaching, we referred to it as bully ball, where you were just going to back somebody down or just kind of manhandle them on the way to the rim. And then and whenever Henry had a Galloway or a Lander or one of the freshman type players on him, he just either backed them down or he just kind of muscled them into the paint to get what he wanted. 
And when Race was guarding him on the post, or excuse me, if Race had to guard him on the wing, he was a, little, a step quicker and Race was chasing. And as you mentioned, just solid fundamentals. Got in there, jump stop, pump fake, Race went, and he lays it in. So, But I thought Jerome's fouls were huge. And, and it came really kind of clumped together. He started the second half with no fouls. And then like within the first eight minutes, he had four. And in hindsight's 2020, but man, I would like to see this with tonight with Ray, if Jerome could have played, you know, way more minutes in the second half but instead of having to sit on the bench with the foul trouble. Yeah, their size is just – it's a game that I know IU well, – they've talked about playing Jerome a little bit more at the three, but you almost needed to be able to play him there tonight because when he got bumped down to the four when Race and Trace and everybody else was in foul trouble in the first half, they really struggled to keep them off the boards. That was another big – storyline for me in the second half was the offensive rebounding of Michigan State giving themselves a lot of chances and then you know you did that with Jerome and then you had smaller guys trying to guard Henry which didn't really work out very well but um you know Chris wanted to circle back to 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 trace a bit here uh he ends up only taking five shots over the course of the game uh was one for five did get to the line 10 times and was seven out of 10 from there finishes with seven rebounds although only two of those on the defensive end five of them uh were offensive it, and it, like I said before, Robbie Hummel made something of him getting upset uh, on the sideline in the second half. I don't know, and they didn't really show the whole exchange if it was at Archie or somebody else. I, he had gotten frustrated with what he thought was a foul call not long before that. I think when he went, you know, before they went to the sidelines, I think he thought Bingham um, got him. But this was just a game. Michigan State was super physical with him, just running guys at him. They defended him differently. As soon as he put the ball on the floor, they had a guy trying to dig and, and double on him a little bit. Um, so I think that frustrated him a little bit, but, you know, kind of assess where maybe you thought that frustration came from and, and, and maybe what, what ultimately led to that. You know, I, I think the first half we didn't take advantage of enough one-on-one opportunities, but the fact is, is that Bingham's athleticism caused problems in the first game. And it caused problems again tonight, uh, uh, you know, and he's just so long and so athletic. And I think, you know, we've seen situations with Trace playing against much bigger and more athletic centers where he doesn't seem to go as much into the defender as, as he kind of turns away from them. And again, you know, he he has his, you know, whether he's trying to go his right over his right shoulder or left shoulder. But the point is, is I think that we didn't get the ball to him enough in the first half when there was more one-on-one action. And then the second half you had Bingham on there. Then you had Gabe Brown, who was kind of pestering him when the ball was dumped down and, and Brown's got the wingspan to cause all kinds of issues for them. And again, it's one of those classic situations where whether it's, he was just getting irritated from not getting the ball enough or whether it was a foul situation, it clearly was messing with him and his, his demeanor. And, and maybe it was, you know, there was a couple situations where he got pulled in, you know, whether it was the, when he picked up the third foul and then he kind of had a breather on the sideline, whether he was upset because he got pulled and was not back in the game. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's just a vented frust- or bent up you know, frustration from several different factors. I mean, obviously, you know, <laughs> there was 45 fouls called in the game tonight. So, you know, the whistles were out and about. So that's, you know, that is neither here nor there. But I, I just think that, you know, when we shoot as bad as we had tonight, and the defense adjusts to that, and your best player has no way of getting the ball inside without being pestered by at least two to three players, it's going to cause a lot of frustration. Now, if that's the, the sole reason for his frustration or not, I'm not sure. But clearly, uh, you know, he was off in more than one way tonight, and that, that was a killer for us. Yeah, it was interesting. That, trying to look a little bit at some of the, the postgame comments. Um, you know, they asked him, I asked Archie Miller about it, said, you know, didn't, remember the, that particular moment, but just said it was an easy game to play in. A couple of those calls are very tough. Uh, I thought especially once he picked up his third foul, it kind of got him out of rhythm. I think that's probably some truth there. I thought the first one he got called for, that charge, where he didn't hit, uh, I think it was Malik Hall square at all, and he just falls on the ground, and they, uh, of course, reward that with a uh, with the charge call was, was pretty egregious in terms of the ones that Trace got. Also got the, I think his third was the one where Lankford jumped up and came down on Trace's back and fell, and that was... Uh, apparently a foul uh, as well, but uh, you know, <laughs> Jeff. Before we before we break, you know, what, thought thoughts on Trace? Just kind of what even schematically, IU could have tried to do differently with him. What what his biggest struggles were, and really um, getting the ball. I know, I know. Sometimes we come on here and talk about it's a mix of the guards, it's a mix of Trace not really posting hard enough. It's 
you know, this, that, and the other. I, what, are, what were your thoughts on, on what led to him only getting five shots tonight? Well, part of it was the fouls. I mean, the fouls he got and also he got fouled. I think he went to the line for 12 attempts tonight, 10 or 12. So yeah, he, he went to the line. So that means he was getting fouled on some shot attempts. So you also got to sometimes read into that a little bit. Now, five still not enough. Don't get me wrong. Um there are times I don't think Trace posts up as strong as I think he should. And that's probably just a personal preference for me. And I also think he shies away from the context of, you know, they talked a little bit on the game tonight about a couple of the Michigan state guys going up through the chin of the IU defender. And that's where I think I'd like to see trace once in a while go really kind of strong and up through, but that's not going to change at this point in the year. That's something you got to change in the off season. They did a couple sets in the first half that they never came back to in the second half. Now we didn't hit it, but they ran a little action where trace was opposite the ball. And then like Al or one of the other guards would cross screen for him to bring him across to, to the strong side. And we didn't feed it. And, And I was on with after the Iowa game and, now, I remember telling Jared that I really like watching Iowa. And I know Fran McCaffrey's teams are sometimes, you know, want to pull your hair out because they have all the offensive talent in the world, but sometimes won't defend. But they may be the best team at feeding the post. And there are times when I know it gets clogged. Chris is right about that. It gets clogged. But we just give up way too easily in trying to get it to the post at times. And my opinion is sometimes you got to be a little more patient and feed that post and make the double teams come and see if that will open up some things. But – but I just – we didn't run some sets that we'd been doing lately. Like I said, that little cross-screen action. We didn't seem to put Trace in a lot of ball screen action. And one of the things we were talking about on Twitter during the game was our guards, it was something that was really pointed out. The guards don't get shoulder-to-shoulder shoulder on some of the ball screen action. Lander's better at it than the others, but they leave gaps. And it's hard to get a good pick-and-roll run if you don't get shoulder to shoulder and then the guards at times don't turn downhill so there's a lot of things there so yeah trace was i thought the frustration came because i thought pretty much we didn't see it on camera but i think archie got into him about not screening out on an offensive rebound put back and i think that's kind of what may have precipitated but i think it was just a whole lot of season game moment frustration that boiled over and i i don't necessarily have a problem with it we saw that happen down in what was it texas a couple weeks ago where they had some guys that were you know out and then they came back and won the next game but i I like passion but you just got to make sure you're not crossing that line of passion over into you know the worst part of it yeah i i think you're right i think it was an accumulation of a lot of things without you know knowing specifically what the exchange was but uh, I think he was certainly frustrated because this is the kind of teams that really has flustered him over the course of his career. Guys who are super physical and Michigan state just had a revolving door of guys who were going to go out and grab him and push him and, uh, and do whatever they could to kind of get him out of rhythm. And, and he ends up getting a few fouls. And I think that was a big part of it. in some of the struggles that we talked about with getting him the ball, uh, I'm sure played a role as well. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, but when we come back, we'll continue to break down IU's 64-58 loss to Michigan State, and we'll point out the meaningful moment you might have missed and go inside the numbers to look at some important statistical notes from the game. We'll listen to the assembly call. Stick with us. Hey, this is Max Bielfeld, Big Ten champ and better than advertised sixth man of the year in 2016. And speaking of better than advertised, join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the assembly call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosiers. And welcome back to the assembly call IU postgame show where apparently we need to do some uh, overdubbing of the names that the uh, the players have left on here. I'm Andy Bottoms here with the other coach, Jeff Marlowe and Chris Williams, a.k.a. IU Artifacts. And we're breaking down IU 64-58 loss at Michigan State. And right now it's time for... Meaningful moments that you might have missed. Uh, you know, I had, I had a few and I, I feel like I, I probably alluded to, uh, to a bunch of these, but there was a, a play that, uh, Anthony Leal made that was, uh, I didn't think he played, he didn't play a lot again in a game where a lot of guys had foul trouble and you were struggling to make shots. Uh, potentially there's an argument to be made that, uh, that he could have been out there. He missed a corner three that I thought was, um, open an opportunity for him, missed another three at the end of the first half that, uh, was some pretty deep, but you know, he, he ended up picking up a big offensive rebound, getting a kick out to Rob for a three that put IU up 23 to 20, uh, in the first half. And, and so I thought 
that was one of the it, it seemed like in the second half there was a lot more of Michigan State making some of those hustle plays on offensive rebounds but I thought that was uh, an important one for for Leal. Um, talked about a lot of the uh, the Rob plays where um, you know he was just more aggressive, uh, was able to get the ball to uh, to race and um, you know Christian Lander again. I thought there was he made some good plays. They had another ran nice inbound set that they've been running all year, where you know they get the ball to the top of the key to the big. Uh, one of the guards curls around to the top, and so uh, Lander ended up making a, a you know. A, about a 15 footer, uh, off of that. I thought he had some, I thought he had some nice plays, uh, as well in some of those settings, certainly made some mistakes, but, uh, you know, in a game where you really needed the freshmen, uh, they were the only guys coming off the bench. I, I thought those were a couple moments from, from them. And Jordan Geronimo, I, th- I thought got overly aggressive at times. You know, his third foul was one that was, uh, avoidable in the first half, but also, uh, was aggressive going to the basket, made a nice play, faked out Hauser. I think it was on a, you know, they kind of faked a dribble handoff and uh, he got to the rim for, for a basket. I uh, got fouled on another one and got there. So I thought um, some general moments, Galloway had six rebounds and, and made a couple nice drives, still struggling to shoot the ball from the outside. But um, you know, to me, a lot of the meaningful moments were, were around just the freshman kind of making plays. And again, you know, we've, we've had some of these games where you didn't get a lot of contributions off the bench from those guys, but you ended up with 16 points, uh, off the bench from, you know, really it was Lander, Geronimo and, and Galloway. Um, but I thought they had some, they had some nice moments, struggled at times defensively, got absolutely attacked defensively. And you could, uh, almost see Henry's eyes light up when one of those guys was guarding them. But, um, I thought they chipped in with some good, uh, some good moments there for sure. Chris, uh, thoughts on, you know, any of those moments in particular or just the, uh, the, the freshman as a whole? I mean, freshman as a whole, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really want to see Leo more on the game on, on the floor. I think that was the one thing that I, I still wish we would have seen him more, but you know, he's in there to shoot. Uh, and, and, and a lot of cases, I think he was still out of position defensively. I kept was, was wondering if that was going to be something where we might've seen him on Henry. I don't think that would have been a good matchup overall. Uh, I think we kind of switched everybody on Henry and it didn't work no matter what, um, Galloway, you know, I, I like his defensiveness on the floor. I like, you know, what he can do in space, but, um, I, I think the, the big thing, and I don't mean to so, that sound so negative about it, but I think the big thing with Trey is that he's just such an offensive liability. And I think that's going to continue to be something and hopefully that he'll get his shot. You know, we heard about him coming in that he had the ability to shoot coming out of high school at Culver. So um, I think with, I, I, you know, I think with Lander, that is the, um, that's the one area that I think is the bright spot because he's finally becoming more natural. I think we've talked about this on prior episodes is that if he had more of a preseason, we may have seen his development come earlier. Um, but I, I just think overall, um, you know, it's not a hard lot. I mean, it's hard to be positive on a lot of it, but just, you know, yeah, it's hard, it's hard <laughs> for me to really come to a positive conclusion to that statement, honestly. So. Jeff, thoughts on the uh, the play of the freshman tonight? Yeah, I, I agree with you and Chris. I thought just the overall play. There was a time there in the first half where we had uh, Geronimo, Lander, and Galloway on the floor at the same time, and I really thought that was an interesting lineup. And and again, I'm not all trying to just think about the future, but I, as a coach, I've always kind of got in the back of my head, what do you look like next year? And I may not play some a group necessarily with that thought process from my head, but I would have watched some film and been like, oh that group's got a chance to be pretty decent next year. And I agree. Galloway's shot's got to get better. He's got to work on it a little more, but he brings a toughness. He brings, he brings an, and one thing that I just find that's lacking, at least it doesn't show up on the floor is I don't see a high basketball IQ from the team. And and Galloway's a kid that has a lot of a you know, basketball IQ and he makes some mistakes now, I think, because he almost wants to play too fast, but I think it'll be easier to slow him down and get him into that mode of being able to play at the college speed that you want him to kind of be in helter skelter. I wrote down kind of the, the last time we had the lead was 49, 48. And that was on a drive that Trey made to the, to a layup on, you know, from about the three point line in, but I really liked the lineups tonight. I agree with Chris and you both that um, I liked it when we went with the freshman, I liked Lander out there with Rob. I liked Lander and Leo and Ger- or Lander and Geronimo and, 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 um, 
Justin Galloway out there. And I think even Leo had a run with that group as well. So, but I'd like to see more of that. And I know the season's coming to an end, but I, I'd like to see more of that. Cause I think that we have a chance to be a little better offense and defensive team with those guys in the future. And you got to start somewhere and why not now? Yeah. Any other, uh, you know, moments in particular that, that you guys had, it, obviously the big run there toward the end with, with Henry kind of following the, the shot with Al, uh, was a big one. You know, he, he misses that shot. They come down on the other end. Uh, I forget who it was at the top of the key. I don't know if it was race and Rob or Rob and TJD. They seem to get kind of crossed up on what they wanted to do at the ball screen at the top and, and both left Henry for a second to take a three and he gets shooters roll off the front of the rim and, um, you know, that really sealed it for IU. There was another stretch that I had noted earlier, but IU kind of came back from it. Um, it was, it was a stretch where, uh, Gabe Brown hit those couple shots. I guess only w- one of them, uh, wasn't a three after all, but that was another kind of rough stretch for, for them. They had a, a, a bad possession. He hits a three, you know, Al drives trying to get fouled, misses Brown goes, hits another shot. And then Lander took a bad three there just, you know, again, so as much as the freshman played well, there were times when, uh, you, you know, they played like freshmen and, and you got these lulls where uh, you couldn't score um, in, in some of these key moments. But I think, you know, the, the meaningful moment that you might have missed is not uh, Al making that air ball because I think everybody, you know, in that moment was like, all right, this was, you know, felt like a great chance. You make that shot, you got the momentum. And then to go down and give up a three on the other end after that uh, was was really the dagger uh, at that point. A- any other moments that you guys had uh, had marked down that you wanted to hit uh, in the game? I mean, the only thing I would just say is that I, not necessarily a specific moment, but <clears throat> I saw a lot in, in Rob's situation being a leader on the floor. And I know it's people are going to say, well, he should be a leader. It is obvious. But I think he was as vocal tonight as I've seen him the entire season. And that was something that was extremely positive, um, especially communication, you know, especially after a made basket, getting the guys set in defense. And I think he kind of set the tone, especially in transition defense, which I thought for the most part was good tonight. I thought in the half court, it really struggled toward the end with with obviously Henry getting going. But, I mean, I, I, I want to allude to the positiveness about Rob, even though, you know, shooting-wise it wasn't there. I thought leadership on the floor and def- defense overall was good. Um, but, you know, I think that's something from a broad perspective, but maybe not a single moment. Yeah, I think – the, the Rob stuff is interesting. I think it was Hummel who who mentioned it on the broadcast was like, why isn't this guy the Rob Finnessy that we see on a more regular basis? So coach, here's your chance yeah. to play armchair psychologist. And uh, in that, I think, you know, that's been talked about so much with Rob. Just is it a confidence thing? Is it is how much of it's mental? And then you see him come out tonight and just be really aggressive. And even if that meant he made mistakes or missed some shots, at least he, he was playing with some confidence. I mean, you have any theories on or or experience that that suggests what may cause something like that with with him to to go that way? Because I noticed what Chris did; he was really into the game early, uh, really vocal, really talking to guys in the huddle, uh, which is great to see. But you know, I kind of come back to the like, why can't this happen every game or or more games than it does? I, man, I wish I knew because I I had a couple of instances in my coaching career like that where just kids that just didn't always bring it game after game. I was with, with Chris. I really liked that very first. I may have been the first shot attempt that Rob had, but it may, it may not have been the first, but early. He went for that drive and he was going to dunk it. And I know it didn't. he didn't make the dunk, but I liked that mentality. And I, I just wish we could get him to play that way all the time. My philosophy or my thought here, Andy, is I think to a certain degree, he's he's been I don't want to say drilled but he's been the, the the focus for him has been to be more of a traditional point guard and to be a think pass first score second you know lead but I think he would have been better off from day one and maybe he really was as a freshman maybe it was the injuries the concussions and things that kind of took that away but his freshman year, he looked to score more he was more aggressive coming off the ball screen he was looking more for a shot. Now it's almost at times like you feel like you almost have to beg him to shoot. Now tonight was different, but other games there are games where you feel like, please shoot. Here's the ball. Please shoot. And I just don't have a simple answer for that. Um, one of my meaningful moments I wanted to come back to was um, right after trade giving us a lead, we fouled. And it was um, – and they hit the first free throw. 
and then we didn't screen out on the second free throw. We give up an offensive rebound, and, and a, I think it may have been a dunk, and they get the lead that they really never relinquished. Al hit two free throws to tie it, but we kind of played catch-up from there on, and, and we never really recovered. To me, that was a one of those games. Those, you look back, and everybody's, oh, it was just a, a missed blockout, but that missed blockout, in my view, if you get that rebound, maybe you go down and score and take the lead, and you got a chance to make them chase you. Yeah, that's a uh, that's definitely. I'm glad you mentioned that one because I had I had forgotten about it a little bit. But yeah, that really started their run down the stretch. That was Henry was the guy at the line and that made the layup. He kind of used his put his hand down to balance himself as he was going back to the basket on the on the rebound. Well, there's about ten guys laying on the floor. It felt like, or I guess it couldn't have been ten, maybe maybe seven. Uh, but uh, you know, bodies all over the place, and he gets to the basket and you give up three on that. It was good for Al to come back down and make that shot, but that really in some ways got Henry going, it felt like, and, uh, I, you never really, never really recovered from, uh, from that standpoint. Uh, so let's go in, uh, inside the numbers and look at a few things. And that's probably a good place to start offensive rebounding. Uh, Michigan state ends up with 13, although I'm going to look here and see how many they had in the second half. Cause it felt like, yeah, eight of eight of those, um, 13, uh, came in the second half. And I thought they were, I mean, there were a couple of possessions where they got four shots at it or, I think there was one they really got three or four shots at it right at the rim that somehow missed. But, you know, those things just kind of wore on IU. And I think that's where their size just even from the wing in particular uh, was a really big factor from a, a rebounding standpoint. So that was one area that uh, that certainly favored Michigan State in the second half, although uh, second chance points, you know, ended up only being actually in favor of IU eight to six. But um just felt like those those gave them some extra extra possessions there when they needed it. Um, turnovers was was not the issue tonight. Uh, only eight for IU, nine for Michigan State. Uh, th- this to me, from a statistical standpoint, was almost entirely uh, about the shooting. Um, you end up with with IU eighteen of fifty five, thirty two point seven percent from the floor, two of twenty from three. Got ten shots blocked, which I think is the second time in uh, the last few games when they've had double digit shots blocked. Um, you know, just, you, you're just going to struggle to beat anybody free throw wise, 20 of 29, 69%, not terrible. Um, for IU certainly missed a few down the stretch that would have been nice to have race missed two. Uh, I think trace split, uh, split one, you know, late in that sequence, but you, know, you get to the line 29 times versus 55 field goal attempts. You'd feel pretty good. Just the, the shooting was just terrible. Uh, and, not that it was all that much better for Michigan State, quite honestly. They they only shot 23.5% from three, 37.7% from the field, and uh, roughly the same percentage from the free throw line. So, uh, you know, kind of kind of ugly. Uh, Chris, any, any of those numbers stand out to you or any others uh, as you look down the stat sheet? I think the block situation was huge because I think so many times we we took a guard down the lane and Bingham just took it out of there, no problem. And I think we tried to be aggressive with that, but when the guy you're going up against is seven inches taller than you and he can play straight up against you and not have to, to you know, lean in on it, it's not going to really work. And I think we got lucky a couple of times and Al drew a foul or, or Rob drew a foul in those situations. But I think the block shots were huge. And like you said, you know, we go into the first half, we shoot 7% from the three-point line. 7%. You're not going to get it done. And we were tied at half, which amazingly with that – and we actually shot 75% in the first half from the free throw line, and we digressed slightly. But like I said, you know, if, we're, if we pride ourselves on getting to the line so much as a program and we keep hearing about Trace getting the line, Trace getting the line, there's always that caveat that says, oh, by the way, he's getting to the line, but he's shooting 66% from the foul line when he gets there. So I think we, we miss a lot of free throws. You know, we saw Race miss the front end, two of them in the front end in that second half. I don't know. There were some points where he just looked worn out, and I don't know if it was still recovering from getting whacked in the face a second time. But I think, again, the block the blocks to me was huge because we tried to be aggressive in the lane. Um, even when they were packing the lane, it wasn't happening. And when you can't, you know, drive in and find a guy to kick out to and, and hit an open three, uh, you're just not going to win a lot of ball games. even going up against a team like Michigan State tonight that was – abysmal too from times. I mean, there was moments in the game where I was just waiting for somebody to hit a shot uh, either side. And it's, you know, it was a hard, it was hard to watch. Yeah. I mean, it felt like a game where if you could have gotten, it was a, 
I think Rob hit a three in the second half, and then he got another one in the possession almost right after that. And it was like if if I you could have strung together just a couple makes in a row, you know, maybe they could have you know opened up a little bit of a lead at least. Now we can argue whether they would have let Michigan State back in the game or not based on based on history, but just couldn't ever really score on enough possessions in a row. There was one stretch, I think it was the second half where. They actually didn't call fouls for a few minutes, and and the game actually had a good flow to it. IU wasn't getting stops. Hauser was scoring in the, you know, on a couple of jump hooks, but at least there was some flow to the game. And I don't know if that contributed to the offensive struggles for a team that has already struggled a lot offensively. But yeah, that was just just sitting there dying for somebody to to make a shot or two in a row to really go on a run, and it never really uh never really happened. Jeff, any any stats stand out to you? Yeah, I just want to comment about what you're talking about, Rob's three. I think I found that in my notes because I had that circled. Uh, he hit a three to put it at 38-33, and then he missed the next trip down, and it rattled in and out. And, yep. boy, that could have been a huge segment. In a game where both teams were struggling offensively, a five- or a six-point lead might have felt huge in the second half with approximately 12 minutes to go. Yeah, a couple stats, Andy, for me, that because I talked about these in my scouting report on the community. Uh, in the first game, we got outscored in the paint – and then tonight we outscored them 28 to 20 in the paint as and as Chris said that was with 10 block shots by Michigan State and then we outscored them by one on fast break points 15 14 and I didn't feel like we played at a very good pace overall and then the other one that really I thought was going to be important and shows you what you know sometimes just what you mentioned shooting is such the game that you know I, I was at a clinic one time with uh, one of Doc Rivers assistants and basically it's a miss or make lick you either make shots or you miss shots and uh, tonight we obviously were missing but my point was about points in the paint or uh, bench points in the first game we got outscored 34 to 5 by the Spartan bench tonight it was 1916 I mean if you would have told me after the game that we would play that even points in the paint tra- uh, fast break points bench points I, I would have had us winning but man like Chris said you can't shoot you know one for 13 in the first half on threes two for 20 for the game and and, and you can't shoot under 33 percent for the game I just it's a you know we we just have to find a way to make more shots. Yeah, I mean there were there were good looks to be had in in the first half. There was a play toward the end of the shot clock. Rob got the ball in the lane, kicked it to Leal in the corner. Kind of a shot that we've seen him make over the course of the year. We've talked about the owl one. It, you know, some of this comes back to and and the, and the announcers talked about this as well. There was a play in the first half, and, and this isn't always the case, but some of the times the passes out to shooters are just poor. And there was one that Finnessy basically had to, like, Al drives in, does a good job drawing the defense, kicks out to Finnessy, who basically has to bend over to almost pick the ball up off the ground and then rise up into a shot. And, again, you know, maybe for teams that play with a little more confidence, shoot the ball better, that matters a bit less. But for a team that really struggles to get into rhythm, not being able to step into shots and get the ball passed into the – the quote unquote shooting pocket and all that stuff just that is an area that IU continues to struggle with where they uh, where they put the ball and that was I guess maybe another meaningful moment I, I don't know but I, I think again that, that that not all of the blame for the poor shooting falls on stuff like that but man there are just times when you've got guys open that they need that extra split second to get the ball in the right position to be able to shoot it that uh, you'd like to find a way to uh, to correct. All right. I don't I think the stats uh we don't need our eyes to to bleed like Race Thompson's neck was after uh after what may or may not have been called a foul. I guess well how can we go without saying 45 fouls called in the game. That's probably the uh that's probably the number to end on, I guess. And uh and explains why we started the show a little bit late uh as we work through uh as we work through getting through each of those fouls. So, all right, well, we're going to take another uh, another quick break here, and when we come back, we'll hand out game balls and hit any other lingering storylines and look ahead uh, to what's up next. That will be – and then it will be time for last call. That's all next here on the Assembly Call. Stick with us. Romeo Langford, what's the only thing better than hand a game winner to beat Wisconsin? Celebrate it with friends afterwards. Join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on assembly call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosers! 
And welcome back to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night over at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 7,000 of your fellow IU fans have already subscribed. You can also text IU to 66866 to subscribe to the newsletter. Again, that's IU to 66866. I'm your host, Andy Bottoms, here with the other coach, Jeff Marlowe, and Chris Williams, a.k.a. IU Artifacts, and we are breaking down IU's 64-58 loss at Michigan State. And now it's time for uh, Game Balls. Uh, gentlemen, uh, in a game where only one player scored in double figures, I recognize that scoring is is not everything, but I have a feeling this may be an easy game ball to give out. Uh, Chris, I'll throw it to you first. Rob Fantasy. Uh I'll give you a brief explanation. No, uh, I think... The combination of the Chris, this team has just the just game. sucked the life out of you. you just at a loss for words, and uh, I, I, I think you're not alone. I'm, yeah, I think you're not. I'm alone sitting in a sure. basement. I'm sitting in a basement, embracing our past. Which I'm not going to go there tonight. I'm not going to be that guy. But I'm sitting here in a room, embracing our past, and it's hard. It's just hard. It's hard. But I will tell you this: <laughs> I, I, I liked. Um, yeah, I'm speaking for everybody. I know. I'm. I'm. It's like you know. It is. But good aggressiveness tonight. Um, you know. Good vocal leadership, but beyond that, you know, too many shots not following. I don't really have any other option but but uh, but Rob at this point, and I'm going to stop there. Coach, what about you? Yeah, I'm going with Rob, and and again, was he perfect tonight? No, but I liked you know the the aggressive play. I, somebody made the comment on Twitter that they didn't think he had a shot, at least in going to the last minute of the game. He'd gone about nine, ten minutes without a shot. And that's, you know, I'm not sure whether that's on him all the time or whether that's on the coaching staff, but your your best player in the game wasn't getting enough shots either. You know, TJD didn't get enough, but Rob needed more shots and we should have run more stuff for him, but I'm going to go with Rob. Yeah, I will as well. I thought, you know, again, for a guy that's really struggled, uh, at least it feels like a struggle with confidence. I thought he was a guy that came out in a game that was important to this team and played with confidence and, and tried to dunk on somebody, which is not something I figured I would, uh, I would say, but I thought came out good mentality, showed some leadership out there in in terms of getting other guys together and and being more vocal, uh, and hit the only two threes that IU would make on on the night. And, uh, I thought overall contributed in a lot of different areas from a statistical standpoint as well. So, uh, we'll make it unanimous on that one, uh, which means that it is time for All right, the Mike Roberts Real Hustle Award presented by Evansville Security Services. Uh, and let's talk about Evansville Security Services for a second here. It's the hometown of Calvert Cheney, so ultimately what more do you really need to know? Uh, but ESS provides off-duty police officers to businesses and individuals throughout Indiana. And in addition, they offer an accident reconstructionist who can go, o- go all over the state. So go to EvansvilleSecurityServices.com to learn more. That's EvansvilleSecurityServices.com or call 812-214-1132. Remember, prevention cannot be measured. Let Evansville Security Services help you prevent a bad outcome today. Uh, All right, so this one may be a bit tougher. Uh, Jeff, I'll uh, throw this one to you first. Um, I'm going to go with race. The fact he took the whack across the nose and, and came back, I, I got to say, he's probably tougher than me. That might have put me out for the rest of the game. But he did have eight points. I would have had him for the, the final stats. I am eight points, yep. uh, four rebounds, two uh, two blocks, and I think two assists. So I'm going to go with race. Chris, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to have to pig- piggyback and go with race because I, I think that, you know, whether it's on the stat sheet or not, he plays his heart out each and every game. And, um, getting the same face whacked the second time and, and having to adjust, first of all, wearing that mask, which is not nearly as good looking as the Harris Moyes hockey mask. I wish he had gone with that, that classic throwback from the mid nineties, but now it's neither here nor there, but I, I think he just plays flat out each and every game. And uh, we, whether we want to look at this from in, in grasping at straws, we would have been out of a lot more of these games uh, if we had not had him in there. So he just continues to be a real glue guy uh, that plays his heart out. So, Chris, I figured that was going to be your segue to actually pull out as a piece of memorabilia the Harris Mujicinovich mask that you had somehow acquired in in recent times. But uh, no, I'm assuming no, you've not I, been able to track that still down. On the, still on the hunt. Still on the hunt. 
So. Nice. Yeah, the, I, I had actually kind of forgotten about that until you posted the, a picture of it at some point when we heard that about race. And uh, truly, truly terrifying uh, to, uh, to see that again. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to make it unanimous for, for race. I think I was surprised that he came back out in the second half after he got hit. And then he got hit again in the second half, I think, on the, the scrum following the, the free throw rebound that, uh, that Jeff mentioned a little bit ago. And, and just kept playing. I think he's a guy that, uh, you know, just continues to play hard, continues to improve. Um, and, and so, yeah, that was a fairly easy one for me. I, I, I wasn't, he, he, to me, these were about as easy of awards to, to hand out as there would be, uh, after any game. So we'll, uh, we'll make it unanimous with, uh, with, uh, with race. Um, so guys, uh, before we talk, I, we don't necessarily need to talk pretty preview cause we do have an, an episode of assembly call radio, uh, coming up here in a couple days. Uh, so we'll probably spare ourselves the talk of, uh, of that game, but, uh, a- anything else that we didn't get to from, from this game in particular, anything you've seen in the post game, uh, I've tried to keep tabs on it a little bit here, but, uh, didn't really see a whole lot. sounds like Archie was relatively, uh, short with a lot of the answers in the press conference, but uh, and anything else you guys want to hit before we, uh, go to last call here? Uh, either one of you, Jeff, anything else you got? I just, you felt, I said earlier, I felt like we were in play in situation. And I, and I just don't want to necessarily give up on the season, but man, uh, where do we go from here? And I think that's gotta be a question that the coaching staff and the team themselves are asking and what, how do we, Somehow you got to find a way to win on Saturday at Purdue and, and hope you win a couple in the Big Ten tournament. But otherwise, a season that started off pretty well seems like it's really gone off the rails. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, as I look up and down at individual players and, and different things like that, I think we've we've hit on most of the, you know, key key contributors, key participants in the game. And, and I guess for those wondering from a bracketology standpoint, although I don't have this uh, in front of me at, at the moment, um, I did look a little bit today just to see historically, I got a question on, on Twitter about, you know, what, what it might look like for IU if they could find a way to get, you know, game over 500 things like that. Uh, history is not on their side. And obviously this year is, is unique on a variety of levels, whether that be the pandemic, the number of games scheduled, things like that. But, um, I, I'll leave it that history is not on their side. Traditionally teams that have 13 losses, or more than 13 losses, uh, there aren't too many of those, even over the last 20 years that have gotten in. And there's really only been one team, I think, that's been less than four games over 500 that's gotten in uh, in that same time period. So uh, things are, are not looking good on the bracketology front for IU. I don't know what uh, other consideration the committee is going to give based on this year. A number of bubble teams are continuing to shoot themselves in the foot. But uh, to me at this point, given the number of opportunities IU's had against quality opponents, it's, it's hard to argue that just – with that many chances you you're in just on the argument of you got, you have X number, you know, quad one, quad two wins. So, uh, yeah, it needs to be a pretty big turnaround and a deep big 10 tournament run, uh, at this point for this team to be, uh, to be playing in the postseason. So, uh, I won't get into that too much more, but in case anybody was holding out hope for that, uh, I don't know that there's much reason to do so. <laughs> so, um, I'll kind of, I'll kind of leave that part there. Uh, so coming up for us, uh, we do have Assembly Call Radio on Thursday night. Uh, certainly will be uh, open to any ideas people have for what <laughs> we could talk about at this point. Uh, and then we've got the IU Purdue postgame show on Saturday. I think the tip time for that was announced, and I believe it's 2 o'clock uh, Eastern time, if I'm if I'm correct there. So we'll, we'll confirm that uh, before Assembly Call Radio either way. But uh, So that's what's next for us. And uh, remember to check out our friends at Home Field Apparel. You can use the promo code ASSEMBLY20 at checkout to get 20% off your entire order. And, guys, it's uh, it's time for last call. Chris, I'll, uh, I'll let you go first. You know, I, I'm thinking about what, what's going to happen after the end of the season. I'm thinking back, and I'm not trying to be negative, and I'm not going into the Archie conversation about the coach, and I'm not, I'm not going to go there. But I just know that NIT – is, you know, whether that happens or not, I, I, I think back to 2005 and being in a, a large assembly hall with a small contingency of fans and ironically not realizing the time that I was sitting two seats down from Galen Clavio, not knowing who Galen Clavio was, but experiencing NIT basketball is depressing in March. And, and I, I just think that, you know, we don't really know what to do now as a program. I know that it's it, it, we're all down and out on, on a lot of things. Um, I'm not big on moral victory victories when it comes to 
IU because I, I think that we all want it better than that. But I, I, I sure as hell would like to see us win Saturday just because 0-5 under Archie at Purdue and having to hear from all my Purdue buddies that graduated from Purdue and, and stick it to us every single time and send me messages all the time. I would like to see us win. I don't know if it's going to do anything, and I don't know if anything's going to happen in the Big Ten tournament. Um, but I sure as heck would like to see us win up at Mackey. And I think that, again, it's not acceptable for us to have moral victories to beat Purdue and be happy with that. But um, I sure as heck would hate to see us lose the last game of the regular season to Purdue going into – probably a Wednesday game uh, in the Big Ten tournament. Coach, final thoughts from you? I'm still going to hold out hope. I guess I'm the eternal optimist. I always kind of felt that way myself as a coach until the season was over. But any, any, any hope has to start. I really probably should start already, but you got to win at Purdue. I mean, first of all, it'd be a quad one win. You beat your rival that you haven't beaten in what feels like a decade and you know i'm not saying it'll appease everything but winning definitely is a whole lot better than losing so at least maybe you build with some momentum to go in the big 10 tournament and you catch a couple wins and you find a way to sneak in the tournament but um yeah right now i see a team that looks i hate to say it this way but i see a lot of just like they're checking out and and that I don't like that look I'm seeing and that, and I, that's the coaching staff has to try and figure that out by Saturday, but um, you know, that's not a good look. Yeah. I think to piggyback on that a little bit for mine, I think you just see a lot with the fan base of what you see with the team and it's kind of the, here we go again. And you're just waiting for something bad to happen, which is on a variety of levels, not, not where you want to be, but you know, we talked about some of those plays down the, down the stretch and, IU had weathered a couple small Michigan State runs in this game because of the officiating and and the number of fouls and the lack of flow. Nobody was really able to get on any kind of sustained run for the most part, but you you just kind of got the feeling that once things started to go badly and a couple things went against IU that the the mentality became a here we go again and then the defense really broke down uh, down the stretch. And and that's really what we saw. Michigan State scored. Some of these are – you know, some of these are fouls, but of their last, you know, nine possessions, I think they scored on eight of them. Um, if I'm doing the the quick math here correctly, and and that started with that that play that Jeff mentioned, where you know missed a free throw and, and ended up getting a layup. So you know, three point possession there, and then you know from that point that point forward, they scored on eight and nine trips down the stretch. And again, some of that's fouling intentionally down the stretch, but this team just hasn't been able to bounce back in those kinds of scenarios with the mentality to really stop those runs, get stops when they need them um, on defense and, and make shots when they need to on offense. And um, you know, ultimately some of these stretches like that, you know, the, the Al Durham missed three and, and Henry going out and making one on the other end is kind of this season uh, in a, in a nutshell. I think Ryan tweeted that out toward the end. It's like, those are the kinds of plays that have, you know, you have a chance to make a play and you don't, the other team has a chance to make one and they do. And and that feels in a lot of ways like the story of this IU season, where things have turned in some of these, whether it's an over, the overtime losses or whatever else. And I think at this point, that's just weighing on pretty much everybody. And the minute that things start to to even get a little bit away from the team, uh, it, things can unravel quickly. And uh, I, I don't know how that how that changes here with a quick turnaround. Looks like Purdue beat uh, Wisconsin tonight. Uh, at home and and so we'll uh, we'll see what happens i think somebody i think it was jen posted in the chat something about rob talking about really wanting to win for uh you know al who who hadn't been able to beat purdue and um and those kinds of things so maybe that's a, a rallying point for this team but um yeah it's y- y- you want to be uh be there for them and support them in the hopes that they get up off the mat and um you got to kind of do that and support the team at times when very little seems like that's a, a possibility so all they can do right now is is try to figure out a way to win that game and, and get at least a little momentum going into the Big Ten tournament, or uh, or it could be an early exit there. And uh, we've we've seen plenty of those in the Big Ten tournament over time, so that is certainly not a source of optimism uh, for IU fans by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, we'll be here to uh, to support the team and, and talk about it 
after the Purdue game and uh, even before then on Assembly Call Radio. So that is going to do it for us tonight, if I can find the uh, the sound correctly here. All right. And uh, so if you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel over at youtube.com slash assembly call. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to longtime listener Bob Thompson, who produces a lot of the music you usually hear on the show. And thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk IU Hoops again with you on Assembly Call Radio on Thursday. Until then, take it from me, Yogi Farrell. Keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosier. Thank everybody for coming out. All right, I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. All right, fellas, that was, uh, that was, that was something. It was interesting. Yeah. It was interesting. Tough to, uh, tough to not let ourselves go into some of the other conversations, but there's a, you know, we've always kind of taken the, the tact on the show of, you know, waiting to talk about some Take of that the high road until there's actually, high well, road. that a little bit, uh, it, it, that, that's certainly part of it, but I also think, you know, just trying to. You know, wait until that's actually a, a situation that's presented in the off season. Certainly, if and when a change is made or even not made, um, I, I saw where AJ Guyton inter- or had a on that. Um, I forget the, the field of, field of sixty-eight. Yeah, yeah, he had Dolson on there, so I'm anxious to hear that. I mean, yeah. you know, it is what it is, and he's not going to make a decision in the off season. I, I, you know, there's so many factors with the athletic department that people don't realize that are going on like the 60, $70 million in the hole. And I know people realize that, but you know, the, imagine getting to that position the first year through a pandemic. And now you're got the, the weight of the entire program's fan base on your shoulders right now in this circumstance, it's gotta be a tough situation. So. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to know. listen to that interview yet with him either. So I, uh, I've got it queued up mm-hmm. to hopefully be able to get to tomorrow. I'll be kind of curious to what, you know, there's obviously yeah. probably some tiptoeing around of of that topic, but I oh, of course, but but like you said, we we have to be the the stewards of of positivity as much as possible, and 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 not go down that road. And you know, I know people are frustrated and venting, and and you know, you know, I wish it was ninety three again, and I wish it was eighty one again, eighty seven again, and and we all wish that. I mean, we all wish for continuity with the program. We all wish we were contending for a Big Ten title, and we were going to the sweet 16 and beyond and you know, that's, we're just not there right now. And that's, you know, it's, and, and so many people are negative on it, Chris, you're right. I mean, it's, and I thought Jared made a good point today just to try and, you know, find something that you could at least, you know, talk some positives about. And I thought, you know, we were able to do that, but I will say this, I, you know, I just, I know they're tr- they're struggling. And a lot of athletic departments are struggling, but Auburn found the money to buy out Gus Malzahn, and so yeah. there's there's money if they want to oh. go that route. Ra- if they want to go that route, they and can schools are firing him. I mean, Pat Kraft's an IU alum, and he get fired his his coach at Temple as the AD. So I mean, he got a lot of flack for that. And so I, yeah, it's happening, and you know that's the big question. And and you know I'm. I'm just going to say it'll be an interesting off season. That's yes, all I'm going to say. <laughs> I haven't had, I'm with you guys. I haven't had a chance to listen to AJ's full interview with Dolson, but I got to feel from what little snippet I saw on Twitter, it sounds like, you know, and I, I want to say, I'll bet Scott made it more along the line. He just a generic of, I want, I wanted what the fans want. And that's a winning program. I, it's just interesting to me. And Chris, you're more in the community there in Bloomington and stuff. And Andy's been a little more connected to the program than me, but everybody always wanted to kill Fred Glass, the fan base for, you know, Fred Glass, is Fred Glass. But if you look at across the programs, most of Fred's hires worked out pretty well. I mean, yeah, but they've yeah. been really good. They've been really but, solid. Terry Morin, yeah. baseball, softball, football, volleyball. It, it, it's we are a, but here's the thing. And we all know this. I'm stating the obvious. We are a program. Yeah. Uh, we are a fan base that is, will not accept anything but the best. That's the reality. I agree. And I, I'm not saying that to be bitter. I mean, you know, my parents enjoyed 76. My dad sat in the second row of the bleachers every single game in 75, 76 season. You know, I've had, you know, I enjoyed the early 90s and those Big Ten championships and the final four run and the 93 team and the upset and the situation. And I get it. And we are bitter when we don't do well. And that's just the reality. We are a very, and, and I listen to, <laughs> I listen to, uh, you know, other podcasts of the field 68 and we are, you know, people call us the most stubborn, demanding, 
fan base in college sports. And I think they're right. But I think that it's just that's the way we are. And I think that we have to accept that. And but we won't accept anything but the best. And and that that's it. It is what it is. So. Yep. All right. So before we wrap up, thanks, quick, guys. The uh, yeah, glad we, glad we could do that. Uh, the uh, the IU women. Uh, if we're if we want to talk bright spots on the hardwood, yeah. the yeah. IU women play tomorrow Wednesday at four thirty against Iowa. I think it's on BTN again. Uh, yeah. We watched the uh, good good chunk of the. They're Ohio kicking State ass. Game. I mean, second half they were up in. And, it, and that's I'll really, tell you what, you, you talk about you talk about conditioning and all that stuff. I mean, they're basically again the second half of Ohio State were basically playing playing five. I mean, they would rotate people in when they had um, yeah. you know foul trouble and different things like that. But their their five were going to go as long as they could go, and uh, and ultimately led a fourth quarter. Yeah, you know, fell behind a little bit in the fourth quarter, let it come back. It was uh, a lot of fun to uh, a lot of fun to watch, and they just gutted it out. Uh, with, no matter yeah, how and tired so they were. We need to embrace that. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of negativity, but we have a really good basketball team that's going to be playing in March in the NCAA tournament, and the program needs the support. And the and people who are upset, and they can be rightfully upset, that's fine. But they need to shift their focus and support the team that is going to be playing in the tournament in March. Yeah, yeah. and that's a huge game tomorrow from a standpoint. If they can win that game against Iowa at home, which I'm sure they're favored in, and I think they should be favored in, if Maryland were happen to lose, that would put them, I think, in in the number one seed for the Big Ten Women's Tournament. Um, yeah. So that's a huge game for them. And 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 Chris or Andy, I thought that's a great point. That's one of my frustrations as a coach. And everybody, every coach has different philosophies. I, I understand that. But I was one of those guys that I was going to play my guys until they had to come out or. I felt like they weren't playing well, but if they were playing well, I, I just was never a big fan of first sub, you know, first four minutes, we're going to sub this person at four minutes. And, and I, again, everybody has their, every coach has a different philosophy, but I, and I totally agree with Chris about, you know, the fan base is what it is. And we sh- you know, we do need to get behind you know, the women a little bit more, but I will say this also back to that, everything we want the men's team to be is on that women's team. They they dive on the floor for loose balls. They're connected defensively. They play with some pace, and, and they look like they're prepared. And I think that's one of the frustrations of the fan base is those things. And, and, and I'm old enough, Chris. I, I go back to actually I watched the 75, 76 teams as a kid play on TV. So, But that's I know that's not coming back. I know those night years aren't necessarily coming back. But – I just want them to feel like they're the – and I kind of put this in my sky reports. I want to see them be the first team on the floor for loose ball. I want to see them diving out of bounds. I, I, you know, quit letting guys be so comfortable. I mean, tonight they did a little better job against Michigan State, but it seems like we allow every team to shoot better than shoot three point. Their three-point percentage goes up 10 to 15 points every time they play us because we never make anybody uncomfortable on the arc. We used to. And, and, and I just wish we would do that. If we did that, I think the win and the fan base would actually be okay. They'd want winning. Don't get me wrong, but they, the, they want to see something that looks like what they think Indiana basketball is supposed to be. And that's where the women are. They're playing that type. Terry Moore has instilled that. Yeah. It's crazy. Just to go back to that. And then I'll, I'll go. Cause I got to get this posted, but yeah. I, 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 you, you look down, you look down the minutes played against Ohio state, Alexa Gould 40 minutes. Uh, Grace Berger, 38 minutes, 12 seconds. Allie Patberg, 37 minutes, 18 seconds. Nicole Cardano Hillary, 36 minutes, 46 seconds. Mackenzie Holmes was a starter that played the least, and she played 33 minutes and 20 seconds. So, um, yeah, they just run them out there until they, uh, until they can't go. But yeah, they're a lot of fun to watch. So everybody tune, tune into them, uh, Wednesday afternoon, 4 30, uh, Eastern for that. And, uh, we'll be back on Thursday with assembly call radio, Chris, Jeff, appreciate you joining me. Uh, Chris, we got to start getting you on, on games that are, uh, are, are more enjoyable to watch and, uh, and discuss. I, I, think I think you've drawn the, this season. I think you've drawn the short straw on a variety of occasions this year for sure. Yeah, One for four or one for three, I think is my record. So yeah, on, they've been a couple, games, so. yeah, they've been a couple ugly ones. So I don't, I don't yep. put that on you at all. So we'll keep asking you back. Fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll let Chris go uh, continue his search for the, uh, movie Zinovich mask and, uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us again. And we will, thanks uh, for having we'll uh, talk to everybody on Thursday. Thanks.